Welcome to On and Off The Pitch, a sporting podcast. I'm Rodney Cyrus and with me today for a very special interview is the general manager of Lewis Women FC, Maggie Murphy. Maggie, how are you? I'm really good. Yeah, I'm feeling quite positive at the moment, despite yeah. everything that's swirling around us. Yes, yeah, I mean, I'm so glad I've been able to get to, to speak to you. I saw you at the Arsenal game um, from a distance, well, not too far, and I, I didn't get a chance to speak to you there. So I'm really glad that I'm able to speak to you and find out really about your journey uh, into the world of women's football, where you came from and, and, and the difficulties that you may have faced uh, to where you are right now. Um, sure. Yeah. Important. You're good. Um, you were appointed the general manager for Lewis Women. A year, it's almost a year ago. Yeah, almost. I mean, depending on what happens with the season now. Yeah, I just came in in July. Um, so we, I came in just as we were starting the pre-season. Uh, the players were just back. So in fact, we came in in the middle of the contracts and transfers and uh, signings. So yeah, almost a year for July last season. Uh, so what does the actual role of general manager entail? I love this question because um, it, it comes up a lot. There's lots of people that are like, so hang on a sec, what is this, what is this role? Um, it's very different according to the club that you're in, I think. There are some basic stuff that all the general managers do. So the general managers are your off-pitch equivalent to the managers that everyone traditionally sees in the dugout shouting at the players. Um, you know, we don't have any oversight or any role in terms of team selection or tactics or, um, you know, formation, for example. But what we do do is, um, <coughs> excuse me, we do complement our managers. So we work really, really closely together. And then we're dealing with the back, uh, back room stuff. So, you know, when it comes to players, it might be um, the contracts, transfers, international clearances, those kinds of things. Um, but also making sure that the players are happy um, and making sure that they are uh, supported. Um, Lewis is quite different to a lot of other football clubs in terms of um, players because players often move to Lewis to play for us. Whereas if you're a club in London, for example, you might just you might actually switch from London club to London club without actually ever moving home. Um, but here at Lewis, we have a few player houses, for example, uh, which is a little bit unusual. Um, but then we're also uh, just seeing that there's a poor network connection. I'm hoping I can come back. No, you can still. I'm still hearing you. It's fine. Rodney, did you lose me a little bit there? No, no, I still had oh, you. Oh, you still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So the other things that we're in charge of are things like the marketing, match day experience. You know, we're usually the ones that are in charge on match day. So, um, you know, generating attendances um, and doing that kind of side of things. And at Lewis, again, we're a little bit different because. Um, a big role at Lewis is, you know, how can we build a better football environment for women and girls? So how can we take a stand on important issues? How can we uh, level the playing field a little bit? How can we be leaders in this field um, to drive forward improvements that will have an impact across the country, not just uh, not just for us? Um, so that's, a, that's an important part of the Lewis uh, general manager role as well. Uh, well, I think it's, from what you say, part of the general manager role, it's a, it's a very important part of yourself as a person, isn't it, really? Yeah, de uh, 100%. I mean, I don't think, um, well, I wouldn't have taken a general manager role at any other club. Um, for me, Lewis embodies this kind of uh, football club situation that I think should be the norm, but is so far from being the norm. So if Lewis didn't already have this platform, if it wasn't already committed to it, if it didn't already have its principles and its values set, um, I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have joined it. I needed to know that there was that backing and it wasn't just a kind of uh, paper promise on things like equality or uh, supporting the women's side. It has to be embedded in what they're doing. Um, and with that, we can create this exemplary football club uh, that is uh, doing the right thing on and off the pitch. And I think that's that's really important for Lewis um, for the football club, also for the town. It's, um, it, the, the town itself tries to be exemplary in a lot of things. Um, and, so, and the football club in the town is really symbiotic in a way. It feeds off each other. I like the link uh, between on and off the pitch. Obviously, that's the name of the podcast, so thank you for the plug uh, <laughs> inadvertently. Um, you played football yourself, yes? Yeah, yeah. How easy was it to transition from being a player to being a manager? Um, well, really easy because I think 
really easy because actually this is a complete career change for me. So um, I don't think there is this uh, player becomes manager role for me because when I was playing football, it was always something I did on the side. Um, I, to be honest, I never pushed myself. I never really thought that I could make it. I didn't really think that sport was or playing football was uh, a kind of career choice. Um, I was always very academic at school. So, you know, did my A-levels. Um, I was offered a scholarship to go out to play in the US when I was about 16, 17. And I actually said, oh, no, 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 you don't. You don't understand. Like I'm doing A-levels. I'm going to university. That's that's not for me, which I feel a bit silly about now. Um, quite naive, really. But um, that was kind of what I did. Went to university and actually spent a lot of time, three, four years living, um, well, in completely different circumstances around the world. So uh, about three years in Africa, couple, uh, one year in the Caribbean, so lived in the Netherlands for a couple of years, then in Germany for a few years. But I always found a football club to play for. So for me, it was a grounding thing. It was a way that I could kind of access a community and play within a community. And I didn't really need to speak the language, but I immediately had um, a set of friends or I was immediately able to open up a door into a culture. Uh, so for me, football's always been about more than just winning. It's been about um, a, kind of a social thing. Um, and I've always been able to find that team as well. Uh, people kind of think that maybe there is no women's football in Africa, but there's a football team in every town that I played in, that I lived in. Um, and it, you just have to find it. They don't get the visibility. They don't get any plaudits. They don't get any, um, and there's hardly any financial support, but they are there against the odds, you know, um, against, you know, quite a lot of discrimination in some cases. Um, but there's also some stereotypes to bash as well. The largest crowd that I ever played in front of was in Tanzania. We had about 3000 people play, uh, watching the women's team in a, in a cup final. So there's, um, yeah, and that was almost 20 years ago. So, you know, there is there there are these perceptions that women's football is maybe just kind of big and growing in the US, North America and Europe. But actually, football's every, women's football is everywhere. Um, there's so much untapped potential. It's it's incredible. So coming back to your question, man. <laughs> <laughs> coming back to your question, football was always just on the side. It was this thing. So I had a I had a career. I was doing this other stuff. So I worked in human rights and anti-corruption. But the, the, it's only been in, the re in recent years, especially after the FIFA corruption scandal, where things, I was working in anti-corruption at the time, and everything just kind of fell into place. And there are so many connections for me between uh, the power of football to do social good, but also that challenge because football mirrors society. And if society is kind of messed up, so is football. But if we can unravel and clarify football, maybe we can unravel and clarify society as a result as well. So I just feel like football has this huge potential. But at the moment, if we don't have the good governance in place and if it's really unequal, um, if it's really racist, if it's really homophobic, then we're not going to reach our goals uh, for decades. So I think football, we can't think about trying to create social change without including football. That was maybe a little bit. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's really good. So, so many individuals say that, you know, football is a really good tool and they talk about role models and, and it's a driver for change. But you never really see so many individuals go out there and actually follow up with actions with their words. And I think that what you're trying to do and what you've explained so far is that you have demonstrated that you say it and you do it. You know, and that's, it's quite key, really. Yeah, I think it burned away at me a little bit. Like, I didn't mean, honestly, I never, ever intended <laughs> to be in this role. I never really intended. In fact, you know, still my family think I'm a little bit nuts. And um, my old colleagues from, you know, I was working at, um, I was representing my organisation at the G20 or at the UN. And, and now I'm managing a football club in Lewis. Like, where's Lewis? Lewis who? Lewis what? Um and so I think that that shows, I guess, how passionately I, oh, I, I don't, I feel even a bit silly saying it, but like how important I think football can be. Um, and yeah, let's give it a go. Let's see if, let's see what kind of change, what kind of ripples we can create um, and try and win some matches at the same time. Cause it's also about the on, on pitch stuff as well. Of course, uh, on the website, you say that um, you want Lewis to be the best team in the world. Yeah. Will they be? How do you how, how do you count best? Like it just depends on what we think of as success, right? I think sometimes, and this is a really important conversation during the 
COVID-19 situation right now, we we tend to think of success and successful football clubs as those that win silverware and generate loads of cash. Maybe the most successful football club is one that is doing incredible things in its community and is well loved and well supported and uh, gives as much as it receives. I don't know, maybe we just have to uh, clarify what best is. Well, you know, in terms of best and being rich, some football clubs can be emotionally rich, they can be financially rich. I think in, in essence, Lewis is definitely emotionally rich. Now, we talked about the COVID-19 situation mm. that's caused the bulk of football to, to stand still and the rest of sport. How are you coping with this, uh, this break in football and how are the players coping with this break? Yeah, let's maybe talk about the players first. I think um, this is quite unique maybe to the championship women's players, um, even more so than the WSL players. But my players are semi-professional. Mm. They are teachers. Um, they are carers. Some of them are still working. They are key workers. Um, they are going to university. And then they come and train with us in the evenings and daytimes uh, once or twice a week if they can. And then they have games their entire lives are so structured and so fast paced and now suddenly so much of that is gone so there's um suddenly these players where almost every minute if not hour is kind of mapped out mm -hmm. suddenly they, they they they've lost um that that structure that kind of fast pacedness so i think there's going to be some challenges uh when it comes to players maintaining their mental health um, so far, our players are, are, in general, I think, you know, doing okay. They wish that they were back. They miss each other because it's so tight-knit as well, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the lack of clarity and the ambiguity and this not knowing, this uncertainty can be unsettling. Um, and, and that doesn't really help with the lack of clarity in terms of uh, will, will we, won't we end the league and, and, and the rest of it. Um, you know, and some of them are still on the front line. Some of them are actually caring now for a family and it's deeply unsettling for them. Um, it's not a role that they meant to be in, you know, just the same as anyone. You know, lots of people have turned into carers in the last weeks. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, you know, quite unsettling. Um, it's just a tricky circumstance. I think when it comes to when it comes to me, um, I'm able to catch up on loads of stuff that I've been meaning to do for a long time. So in some ways, you know, having a little bit of space um, is good, but uh, but that's because I haven't yet had a family member, for example, that's been affected. Um, so I'm still feeling quite lucky, to be honest. I think um, what I'm trying to do is um, I've set up the Lewis FC's community network, support network. So we are now um, helping people in the community, whether it's with the classic kind of dropping off medication or doing some shopping. Um, right down to we had um, uh, an 84 year old get in contact with us because they couldn't figure out how to put their password into their Kindle. Um, <laughs> but that's important, isn't it's it? It's important. <laughs> it's totally. important. And I think what we realized, what, well, what I thought quite early on was you know, football clubs provide so much um, value to people in our community here in Lewis. It's where they get a lot of information from, where they get a lot of news from. And because the community is quite tight at the football club, I figured that some people might not feel so nervous about reaching out to us to ask for help, whereas they might feel a little bit less uh, at ease if they were reaching out to help, uh, you know, within one of these brilliant Facebook groups that have set up. And, you know, the football club, they have a relationship with the football club. So, um, you know, they support us. Now it's our turn to support them. And I think what we've seen is people coming through and asking for help that might not have done so otherwise. So, you know, as a football club, we're able to um, do our bit right now um, while still trying to figure out how do we how do we make ends meet frankly, for, for, the, for the future. In terms of, of making ends meet, the, the games that have been postponed, let's say that for now, we don't know when they'll return. Uh, should they return at some point in the future, whether it's six months, four months, you know, December, who knows? Uh, would you advocate games being played behind closed doors or do you want football to come back in its full form with fans singing and cheering? I think it's 
uh, unfair to this this might not be popular it might be controversial i think it's unfair to have games return behind closed doors and i think it's unfair mainly on the players that would assume that our players are immune to yeah, of course. COVID-19. and you know our changing rooms a single room with 20 people in there um asking all the all the players not to high five or hug each other once they've scored a goal like uh, i'm maybe being pity but i think that you know the the health and safety of our players is number one and um We've only just seen in the news today that the um, one of the Arsenal goalkeepers uh, on the women's side has just tested positive for COVID-19. So, you know, players are not immune to this. I think that the health and safety of the players is number one and of the staff that would have to, and the volunteers that come and man and set up the games, even if it was behind closed doors, we still have people here. Um, a secondary concern, but also really important, is just simply... Football is a community event. It's um, sure I'll set up a live stream. Of course I will. And I'm sure that people will watch it. And in fact, we already put in an application to the FA weeks ago to say, hey, in the eventualities, before we realised how big it was going to become, we, I actually wrote and said, look, could we, uh, would I be able to set up a live stream? And like, um, could I set up a live stream? I'm just thinking through the eventualities, but potentially, you know, could we set up a live stream? And even though we're not allowed to um, generate uh, we don't have a broadcast deal, but would we be able to charge a little bit to cover the costs and to be able to generate funds if we don't have audiences? So I'd already been thinking about that um, about six weeks ago. But why? Why would we push it when... Why would we... This is unprecedented. Why would we push for these games to take place without the community that supported the club in the first place? Um, why would we rush back? So what I'm afraid of is we rush back and we play these games behind closed doors and we set up, okay, well, we've got like these six weeks to play nine games and one single outbreak in one single team and we start again. Yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, I have to pose the question because I know that as a, as a fan of football myself and, and uh, someone who goes to games live and obviously keen to watch for sport, um, I've had a conversation with many individuals. They say it may get to the point where they'll take any sport that comes on television. And if it, if the players are safe, if they have been proven not to be positive in the tests and they are isolated, and this is at the, the top end of the game where mm. everyone's having this conversation. No one really has a conversation in the same sense with the women's game. Yeah. All of the points you make are relevant. And, um, you know, as a community thing, as you've mentioned, it, it is that, as a community, everyone wants to see football. They want to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And, you know, when you look at football clubs as they have shown in this current situation, they fill the void of services. You know, they mm. actually are the, the glue. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have to pose the question. I just wanted to get your take on it because I know it's, there is no right answer. There are, there are yeah. alternatives. But then let me give you, I mean, just maybe one other example, because I think that some people obviously want the games to go ahead. I want the games to go ahead. Everyone wants the games to go ahead. But just this morning, I'm calling up our oxygen provider to agree to send my canister back so that they can distribute it to an NHS hospital. So first of all, like we don't have any emergency oxygen at the side of the pitch if there's going to be a game taking place. Uh, why? Because, you know, I've sent it back to the NHS. Um <laughs> where I think it belongs right now. Um, but then I can't fulfill my license, which is that I must have that, you know, uh, oxygen canister at the side of the pitch. Like, there's some really small details here. My my doctor, my team doctor right now is like working flat out um, for the NHS and A&E. Like, I'm, <laughs> excuse me, doctor, can you come back for this game? We've got a really important game against Charlton. Sometimes we just have to realise that, you know, football's not as big as we think it is. Um, and there's lots and lots of these tiny little decisions around uh, really small things that I think people sometimes forget in the desperation to get football back on our screens. I think we all need a bit of a reality check sometimes. Yeah. You, in, in terms of the reality check, I, I know what you mean. Fans up and down the country are, are clamouring for content. They're clamouring for for actual access to the clubs that they follow, just generally football. Um, Obviously, with the postponement, the FA have made a decision about football clubs at a particular level, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically voiding 
the games they played. I mean, do you have a position on that? How did how did you, as a general manager, feel about that? And do you believe or do you have a fear that it might come the same way for the WSL clubs and the championship mm -hmm. clubs? Yeah, this is a bit tricky. Um, I think... Uh, I think that well, whatever happens, some people won't be happy, naturally, obviously. Yeah. Um, and it's very difficult to have objective thinking around this. Everyone has some kind of um, something at stake. I, I think that I, from what I understand, and I'm no medical expert, this is just the start and I think that if this is just the start of the of what's going to be an incredibly difficult four to six months then I think it it's a good idea to not avoid mm -hmm. um because I think that in some ways we need to be thinking through is it even possible to get next season up and running um I, I don't I don't feel I don't feel really strong strongly about whether we null and void it or pause it for like six months. But I really think that pushing the goalpost back doesn't, doesn't particularly help anyone. Um, I think that the real thing that was most upsetting to clubs was the lack of communication yeah. and the lack of consultation and feeling marginalized. And even if it wasn't intended, I think the perception around being marginalized is something that the FA probably has to grapple with a little bit. Um, but I think that's more the issue rather than potentially the outcome of the season. Cause I don't know, obviously no one knows, but I have a feeling that that will possibly, if, if I listen to the medical advice from last night, which was, this is going to be in place for six months. then I just think that probably it's just the start of the other leagues becoming null and void as well. And that's not what I want. It's just, a, a, a practical thing, I think. I mean, you know, it's it's a very difficult situation, and I can sense already. It's, it, you're not sure, like anyone else, in terms yeah. of how it's going to fall and how you feel about it, because there are so many different elements within any di any different opinion that, yeah. that you have to consider. Uh, with that said, you know, um, should if the games were voided. You know, what would that mean for, for Lewis and yourself in terms of player retention and possible acquisition in the future? Uh, if, if the league was null and voided now, it allows us to uh, plan all those things. If the season's put back by a couple of weeks, every few weeks, it's worse for us. Um, a lot of that is to do with the fact that, you know, our players are on contracts, um, those contracts. So, so you know, we're paying our players 100% at the moment. Um, we don't have any money coming in. Mm. Um, so if it is constantly put back, we, we somehow need to find money to pay for wages for players in months that we were not intending to pay anything at all. Lots of clubs are going to go bust. So I think that, that that's why I almost feel like if a decision is made that uh, whether it's null and void or whether it's no games now until September, October, yeah. that allows us to, to stop, to regroup, to figure out what how we're going to play this going forward. Um, but for context, I mean, after the two storms, we the championship had to have its end of season, the date of the last game of the season, pushed back by two weeks. Mm. And we had a full club consultation on that because um, extending the season two weeks had a significant financial impact on us already in terms of player wages. <laughs> extending for like several months is just, it's just not, it's it's not possible um and that's and that's another peg into the well playing behind closed doors that means that we i mean lewis again we're quite different we generate a lot of money on match days um because we get good crowds and 
uh, and the crowds enjoy the match day experience and spend a lot of money at our games because we've we're able we own our own kind of food and drink outlets. So everything we generate, we, we're not renting any facilities. We're not bringing in external caterers. So anything behind closed doors takes away the revenue stream that we'd be paying the players. Yeah. So I think there's lots of, I think that for us at least, I think clarity is really important. Um, but we're one club of, of you know, that 23 that are a part of these discussions. And then and, and very difficult discussions as well. So um, I feel your pain because uh, not knowing the financial implications, players in terms of their security, their insecurities, mm -hmm. whether they're going to be yeah. still at the club, what they need to do in terms of their own lifestyle and, and everything else, the commitments that they have as, as individuals with families. It's uh, definitely a strain. And, and a lot of them have lost their jobs as well because a lot of them are... Um, part-time workers, whether that's in a, a cafe or a lot of zero hours contracts there, so cafes or uh, working as personal trainers, and obviously that's dried up. Um, working in gyms, gyms have closed down. So even for our, even when we say, "All right, okay, girls, um, you know, league's back on in two weeks, uh, get on over here," some of them might have lost the financial means to come back. Yeah. So there's some huge implications there, I think. Um, and, you know, it's a really nuanced discussion. I think, you know, the FA are doing what they can to involve the clubs and to, you know, think over different scenarios. Um, it, it's just a really difficult situation. Well, uh, unprecedented. And, I, you know, I, I just wonder whether in five or ten years time or 20 or 50 years time we'll look back and go wow they really thought they could finish that season why did they why did they think they could uh, was it just for the money um was it just for the broadcast was that really that important did people really think that was important at the time like i think there's a that kind of thing sometimes i think about like there is there is the here and now um, thought process that so many people go through you are decades away in terms of the domino effect. Your, your brain has already moved in that direction to see what the reflections will look like in terms of the historical aspect, in terms of the games and the administration of the game. I understand that. And it's, and it's difficult, you know, but it, I, you know, as a general manager, you more than anyone will probably know how difficult it is, obviously the conversations that are happening at that level. But from a fan's point of view, they just want to see football. They, and, cool. and, and they're crying out to see the, the girls, the players, yeah. they're crying out to be in that environment. And just as much as you've mentioned that the, the players are missing each other, the fans I know, you know, mm -hmm. for every club are, are missing the players, they're missing the fans, they're missing that actual, that community sense, that, that additional family that they belong to. Um, so from a selfish point of view, I understand, but also you are very logical and you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. historically, further on down the line, we're going to look back on this and say, what were we actually doing and did it make sense? And you're probably right. You're probably right. Why is beyond your years, Maggie? That's what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know. I mean, also, these are just, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's things that preoccupy me a lot at the moment and preoccupy all the other general managers. Um, and there, we don't have an answer. We'll be able to look back in the future. And, you know, hindsight is always a great thing. But, um, yeah, it's just... A, I think, I think there's some there's lots and lots of small nuances, um, and there's certainly nuances that I, I won't be attuned to in terms of the you know the Premiership managing their multi million pound TV deals. Um, Not yet. That, that for me, I'm just like, cut it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, but it, you know, it's you 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 can see through your own reality and and and. You know, I think about individuals in the club, uh, my, my players, um, also our volunteers. I, I don't know. I just think that we, I can just, do you know what would annoy me? <laughs> it, it would just really annoy me if we rushed coming back and then we had a single case and then, the, and then you know, then what? And for what? Yeah. yeah I understand. I totally understand. Um, you sold it to me. <laughs> <laughs> you have sold it to me. Um, moving away from the whole scenario of not being playing football, can I ask yeah. you to reflect on the season that you've had since yeah. you've been in charge? Um, 
What has been the best game that you've watched and who has been the toughest opponent that Lewis has faced, in your opinion? Okay, so um, the best game <laughs> the best game was um, it was a hot, beautiful, sunny day. It was the first game of the season, August 15th, our first game, and it was home to Blackburn. And we ran out 5-1 winners. And I was like, wow, this is it. This is... This is amazing. Let's do this every week. Yeah. Um, it was incredible. Like we had, uh, you know, five cracking goals and, and it was only one all at half time. So there was like a real resilience in there as well. So there's a nice story, you know, one all at half time with the manager going, come on, girls, like you've got this. It's just how you're going to do it. Um, and then I and <laughs> and then, you know, then we haven't seen anything like that since. So, you know, football's cruel. Um, so I, we started really well. You know, we were unbeaten for about four or five games in the in the league and um and then our results just haven't come in and you know there's a mix we've um changed manager now as well with our assistant manager stepping up after our um manager Fran Lonzo moved on to Celtic um that's actually a, given a, some of the players a, a little bit more freedom because I think that sometimes the style was a little bit constricting for them um and we've seen some cracking performances so apart from that you know the heady days of August last summer uh, you know our game against Arsenal I was so proud of the players they they put in such a shift and they it was, it was that perfect example of a game which is as much about the mental side as it is about the physical side. Um, you know, our, our, the players had to concentrate so hard for 90 minutes and there's two small times in that game where concentration dropped and, and those were the, the, that was the time when we let two goals in. So... You know, I was so proud of the players because they, they worked so hard and and uh, uh, and also off the pitch, you know, we had uh, very, very vocal fans that when you hear it on the BBC, all you can hear are the Lewis fans. And you, we didn't come did. out and we didn't have hundreds of us, but we, we were vocal. So, you know, it was, uh, I was really proud of, of the club and, you know, of the town as well. Yeah, I have to be honest, I was there that day. The fans definitely made it feel like an FA Cup game. Yeah. And they definitely made it feel like that. And... Uh, it was a very good performance from Lewis. I was very, very, very impressed. You already know <laughs> who I've spoken about, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Yeah. Uh, if you could pick a couple of names from that from that day that stood out for you. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about our two centre backs, yeah. so Ryan Cleverly and Caitlin Hayes. Um, they work. They work really, really well together. Um, uh, Caitlin is just nothing gets past her head. Um, and she flies in for everything. She's our player that we always have to watch out for in terms of concussion, potential concussion. We're like, oh no, Caitlin's, how did, why did Caitlin go in for that? So she put her body on the line. Uh, Rianne is an exceptional communicator. So she's the one that kind of bosses the, the back. Um, so I think that was really strong. But in fact, I've, I've, you know, all four at the back, they, they played really, really well. Um, and then we've got Ellie Noble and Philippa Sava in the middle that, that played really well together. I think for, for our forwards, it's really, it was really difficult because it was, you know, if we got over the halfway line, um, then it was a kind of a case of go, 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 <laughs> try it, you know. Um, but we, you know, actually the first goal, the goal that came against us to, to make it 1-0 to Arsenal, that was after our attack. You know, we had attacked, we were in their box for a little bit, then we had a corner and I think it was from the corner that they won the ball and, and, and uh, you know, ironically... Um, <laughs> Arsenal scored um, on the counter attack, which yes. I'd like to go down on the record. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think those are the those are the players that people say really stood out. Um, but I think across the team, you know, the, the, over the course of the season, we've put in some really solid, really positive performances, um, especially against WSL teams, um, and even you know Aston Villa, top of the league, won every single game this season. We lost one nil to them, um, and that was after we had a goal disallowed. Um, so we seem to pull it out for some of the top teams, and then we're, we've been struggling a little bit against in some of the grittier games. That's where we seem to um, have not quite performed to the level that we want to perform. Well, I have to say, I was there at the day on the day, and um, yes, it was a very good performance. And the players that you mentioned were definitely outstanding. They were definitely yeah. outstanding. They were outstanding. I won't say any more because you told me not to. Well, I just don't want anyone to come in, run in and grab a pedal. But, um... 
They're uh, all very happy at Lewis. <laughs> I'm sure they are. Um, before we kind of bring it to an end, I looked through some of the things on, online about yourself. You did a TED talk. Yeah, a couple yeah, of years ago. You did a TED talk and it's and it's called Don't Call Me Strong. Yeah. Is is that still the case? Yeah, because like I think sometimes um we it's kind of like um sometimes to play football as a woman as a girl you have to be like this strong character you have to you've fought a lot of battles and you know uh, everyone's always um keen to find out the kind of struggles you might have faced and you know only the strong get to the top and i think ultimately what i hope we can do is realize a world where you don't have to be strong you can be um pretty mediocre and average and still be a girl that wants to go and have a kick about in the local park um because no one is going to shout at her no one's going to jeer no one's going to wolf whistle um she's just playing football it's a really unremarkable situation um you know my in that talk I, I mentioned you know i just really want loads of rubbish girls to play rubbish football and to not be judged for it because i think at the moment you still have to be exceptional to play women's football otherwise you won't be given that respect um and so sometimes i have this uh slightly strange emotional reaction to some of the inspirational videos that you see on the social media of course they inspire me and sometimes i think you shouldn't we shouldn't have to be really inspirational or strong or powerful or wise or all this other stuff to be involved in women's football hopefully we can normalize it to the point that it's really unremarkable uh, for a woman to be involved in football that's that's where it comes from well i have to be honest it, it I, I understood the message I, I wanted to, to that to be the last question but this is the last question for you okay do you see yourself as a role model uh i think i'd like to uh, achieve some some things with lewis before i would find that easy to accept i know it's, it's difficult it's a difficult question to answer but i had to answer it and i think because you found it so difficult i would probably say the answer is yes <laughs> it's not that, it's you. not I necessarily feel... about what you say about yourself but it's what i would say and i believe that if, if anyone were to to see your journey so far, they would actually say you are a role model. Definitely. Thank you. It's all right. I struggle with accepting it. But... <laughs> I would put it in the post, but it might not get there for a few days. But there you go. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say that we've literally run to time, but I, I thank you very much for giving me the time to interview you, Maggie. It's been absolutely brilliant. No, it's been a delight to be on. So thank you. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully we can speak again. Yeah, of oh. course. Well, especially if you come down and watch a game that, that, and experience well, proper match day experience at Lewis. I was due to be there against the Villa, Aston Villa. I know. I, know, I was excited to have you down. Yes, so. thank you. Well, I, I, I will be there. Don't worry. Our next... first match back, not behind closed doors, is going to be a big one. Okay. All right. <laughs> not behind closed doors it is then. I'm going okay, to say, yeah, I'm going to say thank you very much to you, Maggie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. That was Maggie Murphy for Lewis FC Women or Lewis Women FC General Manager. This is On and Off the Pitch. I'm Rodney Cyrus and thank you and see you very soon. Bye for now.